Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 457th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. I learned a long time ago that having good tools supports my dedication to being a lazy gardener. Along the way, I've always looked for the best, most innovative products that are fairly priced and sold by a company that treated me like I matter. That is why I'm so excited to find Gemplers. They've been around since 1939 when they started selling tires to farmers. Still located in Wisconsin, they take pride in finding the highest quality product to make your hardest outdoor jobs easier. Gemplers offers thousands of products to help you with your urban farming and gardening projects, tools that pave the way for greater harvests. Over the next few months, I will be reviewing some of my favorites and adding them to my very own page on their website. Gemplers is dedicated to being the best place you've ever shopped, treating you like a neighbor. Whether you're a business owner or a passionate hobbyist, please accept my invitation to get acquainted with them. They've even set up a special offer for Urban Farm podcast listeners. Enter Urban Farm 01 to save 20% on your first order. Visit gemplers.com forward slash urban farm to make your gardening and farming chores that much easier. Today on our podcast, we have someone who helps develop the relationship between the primary pollinator and growers. We're talking with Dave Hunter about native bees. Dave is the founder and owner of Crown Bees, a native bee company in Woodenville, Washington, that sells bees and products online to nurseries, gardeners, and farmers. His experience with mason bees extends over two decades. Dave founded the commercial mason bee industry, Orchard Bee Association, and works with researchers to ensure that what Crown Bees practices is both ethical for the bees and efficient for the farmer gardener. He also co-authored the book, The Mason Bee Revolution, and speaks to gardeners, farmers, and researchers throughout the year. Welcome to the show today, Dave. Are you ready to rock mason bees? (laughs) Indeed I am. Ready to go, Greg. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Yeah, it's it's actually um, sometimes bequeathed with time off. I used to be a real estate director for a uh, big corporation. And back up there in 2008, could you take a hobby, create an industry where there wasn't one, and then make a company that worked through there? And yeah, you know, I'm even going before that. 20 some years ago, my wife was at an aerobics class and came home and said, God, Dave, this, these people had this huge apple tree just full of apples. And we looked at our dismal three or four apples on a tree. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, you know, well, what's there? So we actually went out and met with the person. He's got mason bees. What is that? So the following year, I drilled holes and blocks of woods. I'm out here in Washington. This bee is plentiful. And within a couple of years, all of a sudden we had a lot of apples. Ooh. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you just, you move that thing forward. And finally, when my company closed the doors, I interviewed every possible researcher and practitioner and realized that there was an industry that wasn't there that, you know, it took a few years to get it going. You get it's, it's solid collaborators. You have half researchers, half practitioners, and then you know you move that into a company. And initially, I was just going to get bees for the almond industry, and then we realized it's kind of funny when you put these bees onto cherries and then kiwis and then strawberries. Everyone's getting more food, and then you kind of move past that. Let's get a leaf cutter. It's a summer bee. Right. And you put on beans and and squash and people are getting so what's going on? And so you just slowly expand and I guess now my company we're a food company masquerading as a bee company. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. Just, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why, but when we work with farmers, when we work with gardeners, typically people are getting more things raised in their yard. It's like, yeah, okay, there you go. There's a company. Wow. So you took a hobby and you really turned it into the industry. That's what you said. Yeah. It's not for the lighthearted, but um, you, you slowly get all the right people together and annually you meet and, you know, and, and so be sure that you become the president and, you know, and then yeah, it goes enough and I'm not the president any longer. It's not moving by itself. And I, I get to play owner of a company that has an industry behind it. And we're going to see, this is, you know, it's kind of phase one. 
we'll, as we talk later on, Greg, phase four is having 30 or 40 more native bee industries and wasps that will we hope revolutionize how we get our food. Yeah. And you're, so curr- is- you're currently in phase one. Yeah, so phase you're, one. You're thinking down the road of yep. really figuring out how to help people get set up in the industry of growing pollinators to help us grow more food. That's exactly right. Whether you're in Bangladesh or you know Australia or, or Venezuela, there are native bees out there that just haven't been found yet, mm-hmm. and and they in their all you know in all of these corners, Zimbabwe, you know, in all of these corners, these bees have just been overlooked and are the key to significantly more food per hectare per you know per acre. Yeah, and you know it's just a process how to get there. Right now, it's an awareness piece that um, few people realize there's anything beyond the honeybee. Right. Let's talk about that. I mean, this whole notion of native bees, you've already mentioned native bees, mason bees, and leaf cutters. There's more than that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. When we when you say those words, Greg, you're saying cat or dog. There's, there's hundreds of species of these things. And so across the world, close to 22,000 species of bees. Whoa. Yeah. Seven of those are the honeybee. Mm-hmm. And and the rest, you know, and when you look at those, ten percent of those bees are, are are social. We call it. There's a queen and a hive, and you know, very few make honey. But the rest, ninety percent, are all solitary, and they're gentle little bees. Some nest in the ground, most do. Some nest in holes, and that's what we're learning. You know, is to find the species of bees that we're able to find in each area, and then help people learn how to use them, and you know put them in their yards, et cetera. So yeah, there's a lot of bees. Yeah. Wow. And really what you're doing, if I, if I see this clearly is you're providing housing for them. Yeah. If you look at the bees that nest in the ground, you know, three quarters of them, I can't take a shovel full of dirt and hope that I didn't kill whatever's in the ground and move it from my yard to your yard. Bees that nest in available holes, we're talking paper tubes or, or reeds or like wood trays that you can open up. I can have them, I can find them in my yard and move them across the county to your yard or to your farm. And so to us, the whole nesting bee has value that we're able to um, position them where we want to. So it's, it's, a, it's a good sliver, probably 25% of those bees, maybe in North America, about a thousand species of whole nesting bees are out there. Okay, so that's part that's part one. Uh-huh. Okay, the other part. So it's it's just the bee. Well, why are we saying this bee versus the industrial honeybee? Okay, oh my gosh, Greg, save the bee. There's only one bee in the world. I get it. Okay, I get it. But what what we've learned when you put like the mason bee on cherries, you're getting triple the yield. When you put them on almonds, 1.25, or, or recent research. Uh, strawberries, 1.5 times the yield of strawberries when you're using this mason bee. Wow. Or, you know, we had like a leaf cutter bee. This is a summer bee. We put them on acorn squash, and the farmers complained about too much food. Well, what? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. And he says we, he couldn't pick them fast enough, and so they got too big, and he had to leave them rotting on his field. Or some other farmer said, oh, my gosh, I couldn't pick the beans fast enough, and they dried on my vines. And so you hear this. And well, the, the question I'm always asking is, well, why? And, and this is kind of the difference that people don't know yet. And, you know, I'd like to, if I could give a little mo- moment to explain. Please. A honeybee is a wonderful honey-making insect. And to understand the, how this hive works, there's a thousand eggs laid a day and a thousand bees are died, you know, dying a day. But every little egg, a thousand mounds of pollen and nectar are gathered every single day. Okay. So these bees gather from a one to two mile radius, and because they need so much, they've they've evolved to get it sticky on their hind legs. And, and I actually talked with a researcher out of UC Davis, Dr. Eric Musson. And he said, "Dave, that's not that's not pollen. That's bee food. So all of these pollen pockets on the hind legs is destined for the hive. Okay, and that's that, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. But not much pollen falls off. So where we where we see the honeybee work." They're making up for numbers. There's 30,000 bees. When I put a native bee out there, uh, these guys are really inefficient at gathering pollen. 
It's their belly flopping in a flower, and they're carrying the dry pollen uh, between their hairs, sometimes on their bellies, sometimes on their legs, but it falls off everywhere. And so as these bees are gathering the pollen, it's just spreading. And so one is a pollen gatherer, the honeybee, and the other is a pollen spreader. Wow. That's yeah. a really interesting distinction. So yeah. really one is a pollen collector and one is a hyper pollinator. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, the other kind of key difference too is with that honeybee, they've got this, they're, they're so, so sophisticated. There's a waggle dance inside the hive and you watch the dance and the angle of the dance matches the sun and the length of it and how far it ought to go. So these bees hit a source of pollen and they stay there on that load of pollen until that tree is empty. You know, back to the hive, back to that same source until it's gone. And so they're very source oriented. And the native bees, they start off out of their hole or their ground and they meander in a, I don't know, 300 foot, 100 meter radius and, and come back. So they, they've got a, a huge cross pollination ability as their, that pollen's falling off in a circuit. So those two differences pollen spreading and then meandering has these bees as a uh, better pollinators. Now, I'm not saying they're a better bee because there's no honey, there's no wax. Right. Baby, these guys can pollinate. And so, you know, that's where we're just trying to reach the public, reach the farmers. There's more than one bee. Try this out. Yeah. Well, and this, you may have seen, I'm talking to all you people listening out there, you may have seen a mason bee block. And, you know, I made one years and years ago. Talk to us about where mason bees live. These types of bees that are going into available holes, there's small bees, medium bees, and big bees, and they go in small, medium, and large holes, okay? So what these bees are doing, they're gathering their pollen and, and a little bit of nectar, maybe 30 trips, gets about a pea-sized bit, and they've been stuffing that deep into that little hole. And then they kind of mash it together so there's a little pollen mass there. They lay an egg, and then they seal that little egg chamber with something. A lot of bees use mud, so kind of moist clay. Some bees use chewed up leaf bits. Some use tree resin. And so whatever kind of nesting material that bee evolved with, that's what they use to seal that chamber. So in this hole, they're going to go pollen egg mud, pollen egg something, pollen egg resin, whatever it is. But they'll maybe get... I don't know, six to 10 little egg chambers in that hole. And then really, it's kind of sad, four to six weeks, uh, that's all these bees are alive, they're dead. And those eggs that they laid in those holes are next year's bees. Next kind of year's bees. Yeah, so they're only out flying for a period of time. Some bees show up early spring when the dandelions are there. Some bees show up around the blueberry period. Some bees are showing up deep into August. And so that's, you know, that's when, that's when they're alive for, you know, six or so weeks and then boom, gone. And so you, nature has these bees showing up at different times of the year to take care of the pollen. Kind of cool. Right, exactly. So, you know, I know bee blocks are deep. They can be four to six inches deep. So the bees lay these eggs. What happens mm -hmm. to the eggs in the back? Is it, okay. it cause, you know, because there's, you know, maybe six or eight bees in front of them in a, in a straw, really. Yep, 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 yep. So <laughs> nature does do this nicely. The um, bees on the deep side of the hole, the, the far end of the hole, are females. So as, they, as the, the mason bee or leafcutter bee is, is laying the egg, they can choose to fertilize an egg. Up oh, there's a female. So the inside ones are females. The outside ones that are easily pecked at by birds or whatever, those are the males. Okay. Uh, at about the right time, the males um, come out a little earlier, just whatever temperature pulls them out. Sometimes it's humidity. The boys come out just a little early, and a day or so later, the females will come out there. And they, they just sit there and they wait. And they might even, they'll, they'll, they have a cocoon that they've, uh, there's a life cycle that we can maybe chat about later, but they're in a cocoon. They chew out of that cocoon, kind of break that little material, and shoot, there's another bee in front of them. And they just sit there all stacked up until finally, you know, the and clears out and here's the, you know, and they move out. Or sometimes someone's dead in front of you and you just have to kind of chew past that little carcass and get out. Just kind of a tough world to be deep in a hole, but yeah. they tend to work it out. Isn't nature amazing? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and do they need our help? No, yes, you know, 
where where I my walk, Greg, people kind of say, ah, don't let let the bees do their thing. And where my stance is, if you back out a thousand years ago, there wasn't a lot of pollen around us. In fact, the pilgrims who brought the honeybee introduced the dandelion from Europe because there wasn't enough pollen in the New World. Okay. Wow. So there was yeah. So there wasn't a lot of um. There wasn't a lot of pollen. There probably wasn't a lot of bees. There were bee species, but not a lot of bees. And then you kind of fast forward into us. Oh my gosh, we got such a huge pollen load, and it's our roadies and our yards, and it's our fruit and vegetables needing to be pollination. The bees weren't there a long time ago. We've we're putting a lot of things here where nature didn't have it, and so if you're going to maintain an artificial something in your yard. You know, then you've got to add probably a little more bees than were there. Mm -hmm. And again, if you've added a lot of bees, nature's going to try to shut that down. You know, they will with your yard with rabbits and, you know, slugs and whatever. There's pests that impact the bees because I got too many bees in one place. And so we always ask our gardeners or people that own these bees to, um, there's a little bit of maintenance at the tail end of the season, we ask to maybe open these holes that, you know, we open holes up and do a little maintenance. Here's a cocoon and here's some pest. Eh, you know, there's a little bit of work that goes with it, but we're talking 15 minutes uh -huh. once a year. So love that you're working with mason bees. And in the world today, there's a lot of concern over the loss of bees in general. What's your take on what's going on with that? Biggest piece, Greg, I believe, is that humans are causing the mess. Okay. When you <laughs> yeah, what's when, new there? Yeah, yeah. When nature works against you, you, you know it. And you look at the honeybee, and I think there's ninety something diseases and pests and viruses and fungus and all the you know beetles and stuff. There's enough to say that we're doing something wrong. And if you were to a deep dive into this, you've got too many bees in one tight space, and we've learned that the uh, diseases and mites are being passed in the flowers to other healthy bees that then go to their own hives. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the root cause of honeybee is too many bees in one place, but we need that because they, they don't pollinate well. Okay. But then you also kind of look into, we have a lot of housing and asphalt that kind of takes away a lot of the old bee space. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of throw into, we have a lot of toxicity out there in the, in the world. Uh, the honeybee is able to fly through most of that stuff, whether it's pesticides or herbicides or whatever. And they're a really robust insect. I think the native bees that are not as sophisticated, not that they necessarily die from that stuff, but they might fly away when it doesn't smell right. I think that's kind of what we're learning. Mm, right. And so that lawn treatment, eh, we find that when we're raising bees and someone does lawn treatment right there, the bees just aren't there any longer. I don't think there's a carcass in the yard. I think they just fly away. And so, you know, it's, I think that, that we're causing the issue and I strongly believe that we can create solutions. You know, and that's probably, you know, on, on the solution side of things, bees need pollen. So there's pollen in a yard all year long. The bees that I work with need holes. And so we've got a variety of holes that you would put out there in your yard. A clean environment, you know, if you're going to spray, if you need to spray, do so late at night when the bees aren't flying. Mm -hmm. Or don't. Um, or don't. Okay, I, I'm not being, you know, I'm not being a naysayer. Yep. And, you know, if, you're, if your neighbor's out there spraying in the middle of the day, talk with your neighbor. Hey, I'm raising bees. Would you mind just kind of doing it in the evening? You know, those, and then maybe a little bit of maintenance at the end of the year because you're trying to um, progress the, the bee species in your yard. Those four simple things, I believe, and, and the okay, last little one, Greg, tell your friends what you're doing. Yes. Spread the word. You know, I'm sure that's what Urban Farm, you guys, are. everyone's learning all these things. And they tell, oh my gosh, I learned this about chickens. Well, you know, tell your friends what you're learning. Mm -hmm. That last piece. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want one of these in my yard. Okay. How do I, how do I, so what I'm looking at right now is your bee haven. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. But I want to bring native bees into my yard and nurture them. What are my steps? First step is, is understanding that you can do this. Okay, you're already there, Greg. First step. Bees that we play with need holes. So... Small bees are maybe in a four millimeter hole. Large bees could go into an eight or nine millimeter hole. So there you go. Small, medium, or large. You're putting these holes 
into a house. The house, you know, house is a, a tin can, a beautiful cedar house. This just keeps the holes dry. Okay. Oh yeah. And you're putting, yeah, yep, yep. You're putting these in at about head height, kind of facing morning sun. And if you're just, you know, build it and they come, do that. Leave them there and and just see who moves in. You'll find bees could, if they're there, they'll move in. And wasps. There's whole nesting wasps that are awesome little. They grab soft-sided prey, worms and caterpillars, or hard prey like crickets or grasshoppers or aphids. And they'll stuff those in holes. And so you'll find both wasp and bees um, in these things. And it's kind of that. You know, it's real simple. In the fall, we've got a thing called we call it harvesting, where you're opening these holes. So we're asking people to kind of move away from, there's cheap crud made elsewhere, bamboo. Try not to use bamboo. We're looking for holes that can open up paper tubes. You can roll your own tube around a pencil. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Reeds we've got, wood trays that can be opened up. Old technology is drill holes in blocks. But what happens is pests move in and you don't realize you, you can't get back there. And over a period of time, the bee will go in, do all of this work, lay the, you know, gather the pollen, lay the eggs, seal the chamber, right with the pest in that hole. All of that work goes to, to you know, nothing. And after a while, these holes just never open up. It becomes pest overrun. So a eh, little bit of maintenance. Use holes that can open up. So I'm looking, again, I'm looking at your bee haven. I got one of these in my hands and it's a... Uh, simple pencil. little, yeah, simple little um, plastic cover. Yep. Those are a little smaller. Those are six millimeter holes. The mason bees that we sell use an eight millimeter, but that's, you've got about a dozen holes in there. And then uh, what we do for those that don't have bees and want to try it out, we've got leaf cutter bees. We're going to send them to you. The They're coming to you live, Greg. You're uh-huh. going to push them kind of in that hole, kind of around those little paper tubes. The bees are going to come out and uh, we want them to, here's, here's your house. Girls, here's these holes. You know, there's pollen in your yard. Nest here. There you go. It's real, wow. it's real tough. Yeah. Wow. So this cool. little, this little, uh, it's got car, um, cardboard tubes in it. Yep. Twelve of them, and uh, it's called Behaven. Tell me about this specific product. I, I know we we chatted a little bit before we went on the air. This has been a project for you. This was one. Yeah. Our intent here, it's this this particular Behaven is an early early. Let's just learn about a bee. And so, you know, yeah, you've, you've got this little house, the holes, you're going to, we mail them to you and then you tell us when to send the bees. So if you want to have the bees deep in August, we'll send you them. And really it does, you're hanging this up at a, about head height mm-hmm. facing morning sun. I might maybe have a little afternoon shade for that. And then we've got instructions when you've got the bees sent to you, Greg, or just, you know, follow the instructions and they're real, these bees are gentle. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very hard to get stung by a solitary bee. You can, if you squish them in your hand, or kind of pinch them, you know, underneath your collar. Uh-huh. They're they're gonna let you know they're there, but it's you can't. It hurts, but you can't see where they stung you. It's really, you know, it's a very, it's a gentle sting. That's such a word, you know. Right. But it's it's hard to get stung. They really are. So that okay, that product is that's there. We've we've got larger wood trays we have reeds we got a whole lot of stuff probably the two things i really want your listeners to think through okay and i I know you're actually more of an international or you know you've got a big following greg in every eco region so an eco region means around you the same climate is up you know the climate doesn't care about the state lines or province lines right but you've got the same species of bees or wasps that are in your area and no one knows where they are. Researchers don't know what size hole they go into. They don't know so many things. And there's a lot of people trying to monitor and they identify bees and they pin them on us, you know, put them on a little board and stuff them in a drawer. We're trying to change. We, we, we know that the bees are disappearing a little bit. We're trying to change that. So we've got this thing called the Native Bee Network. We have master gardeners and backyard. We have 4 H people. Go put holes everywhere. And and in this program, we give you a unique number. So you're putting on, there's a smartphone app. You're logging in what you've got. But we're asking people to work with us for four or five years just to see 
what bees are in their area. And then later on, once we figure this out, we're not working with scientists. We're going to figure out which bee match which crop, how to best manage it. We'll raise a whole bunch of these. That's 10 years from now and maybe 15 years from now. We'll have a lot of those bees in that ecoregion that we can then release back to the wild, maybe start with farms, maybe put them in gardens. And so this, when we're talking about bees, it's so new, but we're missing we're missing the bees of the world. They've just been overlooked, and this program is there to help find them. How do we Ultimately, find? Yeah, how do we find that program? So this is the Native Bee Network. If you actually go to crownbees.com, that's my company, you'll find programs in the upper bar, and then you'll just see, boom, right there, there's Native Bee Network. It's We're in the middle of rewriting this piece, so it's a little more um, deeper program so people can really understand it. But that that's okay. That's one, that's one concept. Build it, and they come team with us. Uh, the other side, Greg, a lot of people are raising food today, whether it's a micro farmer. I'm a micro farmer. I have, you know, four tomato plants and, and beans and peas. Okay. If you want pollination today, um, we can help you out. You know, whether it's my company or other companies, um, be careful, make sure you're getting bees that are acclimated to your turf. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People can, you can get bees today. And, and on my website, we've got a thing called bee mail. It, you know, it's, it's a kind of a silly name, but once a month we say, hey, it's June, do this. You know, hey, it's October, here's how you harvest. Wow. So, it's, yeah, and it's, it's, it's one of those things, it's just for free. But we want, here's the thing, Greg, we need the people of the world successfully raising bees so that, okay, my company is giving you free stuff for your bees, okay? So you're exchanging, you're giving me this letter on one of our other programs. You've got so many bees you're going to send them to me in the mail. I'm going to send you free things in exchange for those. And I'm then taking your bees from your yard and moving them into farmlands. You know, and so to find the right bees of Iowa or, you know, Venezuela is, is a long-term goal. Right. But, you know, but dude, you got to start sometime. And we're <laughs> starting, you know, we're starting now. There's my company. You know, yeah. We can help you with bees or you can help us with bees. Either one. I can hear the passion in this project. This is definitely a passion project for you. Congratulations. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's probably, I'll probably answer that when you ask me later on. <laughs> yeah, I kind of resemble that remark. A lot of what I do is for really, you know, transforming our, how we grow food and people's minds about how to grow their own. In the past, and Greg, this is stupid. I don't know, 20 years ago, a lot younger, I realized that if you don't water things, <laughs> they don't survive. Right. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And you and you and you move forward and I've learned that lesson and I don't really in my yard I don't put anything. There's nothing, there's no fertilizer, there's no anti moss. I'm in the northwest, my lawn is half moss, half grass. But I don't I I really relax and let nature do its thing when where I can. Mm-hmm. And I you know, and then where I where I'm bending rules, all right, I've planted beans out here. I don't want my rabbits to get to it, so I you know, I pen, you know, make sure rabbits can't eat my beans. So I'm careful to manage my stuff. But boy, I really have to, I, I'm really trying to learn and uh, learn from nature. And so, you know, as we're working with these bees, I don't want a repeat of what's, um, I think, going wrong with like the honeybee and some of the bumblebees out there. So as we move forward, we're going to be trying to do this as ethically as possible. That's a, you know, that's a, what does the bee need? And then let's go learn how the bee works best and then adapt that principle into my yard, into my farm. That's, that's kind of where, you know, there's my passion. Yeah. Oh, and I can hear it. So I'm on crownbees.com and I went to the shop page. and You have quite a few uh, things to help us nurture yeah. bees in our yard. Tell us about some of your products. Once you've, I'm an engineer by, by degree. And so... <laughs> When you come across a problem, it's like, oh, God, how are you going to solve this? There's a lot of innovation in these simple little things. If you were just say, okay, there's a lot of holes, nesting, there's nesting holes. So we've got wood trays that open up. We have reeds and, and paper tubes, okay, small, and large, et cetera. So there's holes. And then, yeah, back out of that, uh, these holes need a house. And so we've got house and holes or, or house or holes, you know. And then we've got bees. And then all of a sudden you realize, here's, uh, here's a tractant. 
uh, the USDA developed this really cool attractant. So we've got that. We've we've learned how not to dehydrate bees in your refrigerator. Yeah, you're storing them in there over the winter, you know. So yeah, there's some. We've got a book or two, you know. We're we're trying to be not too many things, Greg, but every single thing on this website is purposely there. It has to work. Uh, we I, I honestly just pulled a product. I had some really cool um, the bee defender, and I had it on. I had it out there for about a year, and I I've got about a thousand of these things still sitting in my warehouse, and I'm just going to throw them away because I can't sell. It, it, it worked, but it didn't work well enough. Yeah. So we're just going to throw it away because I have to sell absolute success. Things that work. So, yeah. Yeah. So you'll find that's that's what the website there. It teaches. You know, there's learn, there's programs, there's shop. It teaches, and there's stuff to buy. You know, so, well, so and do that's, both. Yeah, and I'm just going to do a shout out. That's how we, I'll include you and me in this process, make these passion projects work. You know, this, yeah. this is this is what moves them forward. So, yay! Tell me about the Mason B Revolution, the book that you wrote. I'm uh, going to buy a copy right now. It's uh, a couple of things about writing books. This is this is actually it's a sad story. But I'm out there guest speaking at some huge something, and a, and a publisher come, comes along and says, "Hey, Dave, we need you to write this book. Here's royalty." Wow. Okay. And then about I don't know four or five months later, Dave, how's it coming with the book? And I was like, "On page 10. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Yeah. She goes, well, this isn't going to work. I said, "You know what? Here's your money back." She said, "Okay. Well, no, no. We need the book written." <laughs> so they found an awesome writer. Oh my gosh. So Jill, who really wrote the book, she took all my blogs, all our website, you know, all my interviews. I proofed it eh, four or five times. I mean, I really, you know, that's how you write a book. So <laughs> it it has, it's it's a few years old. Every possible thing we knew about the Mason Bee is in there. And it's in a tone that uh, she's such a good writer that people, we get a lot of praise. It's nice to hear people say, you know, I learned so much in a, in a way that made sense. So yeah, you'll learn Mason Bee and Leafcutter Bee is a, is a summer bee. So you'll learn those things in there. And then you you fast forward. Eh, website has probably maybe even more current information. We're gonna have science corner on there soon. You know how do you connect? We've learned that science, the researchers, they make these huge, cool studies, and it's blurped out there into the news, and then it gets buried. Yeah. The farmers don't see it. Right. You and I forget about it. So we've now gotten two researchers who just recent stuff. Could you could you give me a blog? And I don't want to have you this information get lost from our readers. So we're going to go back to like the top 50 studies and get those turned into English and there for farmers and readers to find. Good. It's, it's that type of stuff. So yeah, yeah, that's on our website too. Perfect. Well, I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you learned from it. Okay. I, and I, I know I was prepped for this one. This is, I'm impatient. I learned, here's this awesome bee, and I shouted it out to the world, and no one listened. And I thought this, uh, my company is on the bleeding edge of technology. Uh-huh. I, I thought we'd be so much faster to, you know, make it big and, and change the world than we are. And so that was really disappointing, probably three years ago. I finally just like, what the heck? And my lesson learned is things take time. You know, I mean, in, in if I could share, you asked me to think of a book. The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell is a book that I've read two or three times. Because mm-hmm. it, it really helped me think through that our, you know, is our message true? Can we help people get more? You know, why isn't it moving fast enough for me? And I realize something, sometimes things just have to get there, you know, and that's, we're getting there. It is getting there. You're, you're having me on the show is an example that we're getting there. Yeah. So there's, there's my failure. And, and the answer is uh, patience, Dave, patience. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Don't always like that. Yeah. So I've been growing food in the city since 1974 here in Phoenix. And it's been interesting of late to watch the progression of how the movement has happened. And mm. I was just talking with Kevin Espiritu. I interviewed Kevin and he and I were just comparing notes. Both he and I started just in the last three years doing this full time. Mm-hmm. And he's a good blogger. Yeah, he's a good blogger. 
And it just takes time. And we have to, you're right, we have to be patient. I, I heard a few years ago, as I was complaining about, oh, whatever was going on with the world, this guy said, Dave, you know, the people that appreciate freedom the most have been in jail. He said, the people that appreciate peace the most have been in war. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I don't think people are hungry enough yet. Right. Or, you know, or they, they aren't worried about, you know, the, the, it's not bad enough yet for them to truly appreciate where they need to go, but it's coming. But it's, yes. One of the things I've said for years is that I have a good business, the business model, urban farm, the education, the fruit trees, everything I do, it's a good business during good times. It's a great business <laughs> yes. when the economy is down. Yep. You know, I saw that in 2008 and 2009. I wasn't doing it full time yet, but I actually I, I regularly lecture here in town. And during 2009, during a particular month when the market was tanking, I actually did a lecture at a, at a bookstore here in Phoenix where I usually get, I do it two times a year. I usually get 30 or 40 people. I had 267 people show up. Oh. Yeah. Okay. The other part that what you're the the cool part about what you are doing is that not everyone's we're beginning to not trust where our food comes from. Right. And I can trust I know what I did to my yard. And I think that mistrust hasn't hit the huge tipping point yet. But to learn and apply what you guys are saying, I think is so vital to the future. Yeah. So yeah. it's cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, and teach, teach us good stuff, Greg. <laughs> yeah, and make you, it easy. And you too, Dave. Yeah, dude, there you go. So what do you consider your biggest success? Okay. So yeah, you created an industry. Yeah. The Native Bee Network, that's you know, launched just 2018. That's to me the future of I can get 25% more food nutritious food for the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, it's easy. I can do it. I can do it anywhere. So it's just, we've started it and it's going to take a while, you know, but we've started it and we know it's right. And eh, I'm proud about that. You know, mm -hmm. so well, there you go. Nice. And what drives you? Why? Uh, <laughs> guys, have you heard any passion on this call at all? <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. So I'm older I've got two grandkids, mm -hmm. and I look at them, and I've my generation has messed a lot of things up. I think, oh, yeah. Okay, so, so my drive is I can get more food for the world. I can't help you with the infrastructure or the waste or you know the pretty versus ugly food. I can't help you there. I can get more food for the world, and that is driving my company, and it drives it. It makes me wake up in the middle of the night, you know. So that's yeah, there. You go. That's my yeah. piece. You're, you, and it's, I tell it's people, doable. yeah, it, absolutely. And you know, I often tell people when they ask me what I'm doing this for, I say I'm doing it for the younger generations, the people that are coming, because I'm I'm 58, and we have truly messed this place up. Oh yeah, you dude, you're old. I'm 58. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there and you go. and you know the thing is, it is is it too late? No, it's getting close to you know some, but. You know, and it's not bad enough yet, but I, I am an optimist at heart. The passion's there. And the more people we reach that catch that passion, and, and all it is, is just, it's a flame that if you speak well enough, you can light someone else's candle and they can pass that along. And that's what you and I should be doing. Yeah. Well, and I'll you know, bet, spread. I'll bet mm -hmm. that you get people emailing you about this kind of stuff. Oh my God, thank you for... Yada yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get mostly we get mostly praise. And occasionally you get oh, like my bees flew off. Now what are you doing about it? It's like, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, well, you know, but yeah, I live. I, I work in a company that I enjoy. It's I go I go to fun, probably like you. I go to fun every day, and I enjoy the people at my office. I enjoy the phone calls, and it's it is not as fast as I'd like. But that's okay. Be patient. You know, we'll get there. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think uh, nice words. Nice job. So if you could recommend one resource for our listener, because you already mentioned a book, what would it be and why? Okay. So this is, it's a, it is a funny thing. Years ago, as I'm interviewing researchers trying to understand this Mason Bee industry, the lead guy in the U.S., uh, lead researcher, he said, Dave, let's not talk about Mason Bees yet. Go watch the movie Bottle Shock and then call me back. Okay, and essentially, Bottle Shock, I don't know, was done in 2008 or something, and it was all about the California wine industry 
taking on the French wine and uh, blind testing finally has also in California wines were as good as French wines. And so, all right, I got it. I got it. So I went back to the researcher and said, Hey, French wines is to honeybee as California wines are to mason bees. Oh. Ah, interesting. Yeah, goes, That's there you go. He says the timing, he says they are better in so many ways but they haven't hit their prime yet. Just patience, Dave. And that was, you know, 10 years ago. Right. So, so there was, okay, now, now that I've spoiled the book, that or the, the, the movie, but that was my one resource. It's like, oh, there's an interesting piece of, of this whole industry. Yeah. And what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Each yard and each voice can make a difference for the bees. And I'm going to say, if you've been listening, you're at the tail end here, demonstrate what you've learned and pass this on to your friends and family. It's a big deal. Food growing is a big deal. And you can get more food, nutritious food, beans, peas, strawberries, cherries, when you're um, working with the native bees. So that's it. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Dave. Cool. I really enjoyed it. This, is, this has been a great conversation, Greg. Absolutely. And we want to thank you and your company, Crown Bees, which we have five special bee homes that need a new home. And we want to share them with our listening audience. To enter this sweepstakes, send an email with your name and mailing address to podcast at urbanfarm.org. Make sure the subject line is, I'm buzzed about bees. And I know, right? Nice. That's right? a good one. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. Oh, that's Janet. She's all over this, man. She, I'm buzzed she, about bees. Okay. She just handles all this. So we'll pick five random emails from the first 50 people who respond during our giveaway. And there's a link to the rules that can be found on our show notes page of the podcast. Okay. I'm going to, Greg, can I change one thing on that? Perfect. Let's, let's go from five to six. I want to put out there our big, you know, the big thing. It's called a Bee Works. It's everything. It's it's the mason bee. It's the leaf cutter bee. So five people will get the bee haven, and then one person's going to get our top of the line. Awesome. How can our listeners find you? Best way, crown, C-R-O-W-N, bees, B-E-E-S, dot com. So that's, yeah, you can read and learn and get, um, there's that. Uh, info at crownbees.com has you uh, reaching out, and we answer. We're there. And you can chat online. We Really, the website's probably the biggest and best. If you really need to call us, mm-hmm. you know, grab a pencil, 425-949-7954. Otherwise, you know, we're real fast on the email. And we're, you know, and actually, dude, there's so much on our website, you really shouldn't even have to ask us. Yeah, yeah but- I can see that. Absolutely. Well, once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash crown bees. We are your urban farming resource. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and everywhere podcasts are found. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.